couple of hundred years ago, philosophers, natural philosophers, started to notice that there appeared to be two types of substances in the world. One of these types was things like metal, water, salt, and nickel, alloys of metal, and that kind of thing. And the other kind was sugar, included sugar, cellulose, vinegar, and urine. And the main thing they noticed about these two was that they tended to behave very differently as a result of the action of heat. For example, if you get cellulose and you apply heat to it, it burns. If you apply that to sugar, you get a similar effect, but it doesn't burn. So the sugar basically goes black, sticky. But won't burn. And so on. And the same applies to wood, of course. And you get masses of smoke and so on. Now, when you heat the other lot, various things happen and they return to their original state. For example, if you heat salt, unless you heat it really, really hot, it will simply glow red and then as it cools down it will change colour and it will go back to normal and it won't change at all. If you heat water, same thing will happen. It will boil, it will disappear and then if you cool it down again it will turn back into water or possibly ice if you cool it far enough. So they decide, then they notice that the chief difference between these two, and I've got a fire going on here which is quite fun, was that the ones that didn't change when they were heated were inorganic, in other words they were from the non-living world and the ones that did change were from the living world at the time. That's changed now by the way mainly because of the industrial revolution but also because of alchemy. Now they therefore came to the conclusion, Berzelius, the Swiss Swedish chemist in 1804 came to the conclusion that the laws of chemistry were different when applied to living things than they were when applied to non-living things. And one of the things that made him think this was that when you heat these two substances up or break them down into their individual elements, you will find that one lot, the inorganic compounds, tend to consist of like two or three different elements on the whole maximum. And the other lot tend to consist of, yeah, perhaps very few elements, but those elements could be in the same proportions and have completely different properties. For example, diethyl ether, and ethanol, which is ordinary alcohol, are both got exactly the same chemical formula in terms of proportion, but they behave differently because ether is an anesthetic that's a gas and alcohol is an intoxicant drug that's a liquid and catches fire easily. So this was a bit of a mystery to them. Now, as a result, people believed in vitalism, which was that laws, the law, laws of nature applied to living things was different to the laws of nature applying to things that were not alive or had never been alive. In 1828, the German chemist Friedrich Wöhler managed to make urea. By the way, urine is a solution mainly of urea in water that has a lot of other things in it as well, and they do vary. Managed to make urea in the laboratory. Up until then, it had been thought the only thing that could ever make urea would be a kidney. And at that point, it became clear that the divisions were not as hard and fast as they had been thought to be. And then in 1845, Adolf Kolbe, nobody gets called Adolf anymore, do they? I wonder what that's about, made acetic acid. And in fact, nowadays, the kind of acetic acid that you get in chip shops, for example, is entirely synthetic and not made from living things. And the same applies to the alcohol that's in vodka as well. A lot of vodka is actually now entirely synthetic, which is actually quite appealing to me, to be honest. Anyway, so it was also noticed that all of the substances that behave like this and appear to be living things, contain carbon. Why is that? Well, carbon is special. It forms chains and rings. 
it can share several electrons with other atoms and the chains it makes can branch. Therefore, you can have two different substances with exactly the same chemical formula. Here's an example of ethanol, which is ordinary alcohol. And here's an example of diethyl ether, which has the same empirical formula, but a different structural formula. Now, there are a few elements that can behave somewhat like carbon. For example, that is covered in silicone, which is a sort of waxy surface as a result of silicon being exactly below carbon in the periodic table and therefore being able to behave slightly like that but it can form chains that can tend to be quite unstable so it doesn't generally push itself beyond that point. Organic compounds are organized into what are called homologous series which reflect their names for example. Most of the names begin as follows. The simplest ones begin meth, then it's eth or eth, prop, Bute, and then it lapses into the Greek numbering system, pent, hex, hept, oct, and so on. Now, in these, in these compounds, the end part of the name, the first part of the name indicates how many carbons there are in the main structure. And the second part of the name indicates the class of compound. Now, because they can form that, by the way, that's butane in there. It's a gas under pressure, which I'm going to show you the formula in a second. There you go. And the chain system is actually quite useful as well, because, for example, the metal spoon I showed you earlier is a simple element, actually an alloy. That's a plastic spoon, probably made of polypropylene, and again is formed of chains and now I'm going to use my soundproofing and therefore move this which is my sound system to point out that this fleece is made of polyester which again is a chain of molecules one of the important things about organic compounds is that they can form into chains now I've actually bitten off more than I can chew with this session because actually this session would turn out to be really long if I told you much more about organic compounds. However, I'm going to do another video probably next week about the same thing. So that's it for now. And next week I'll talk about things like fractional distillation and oil refining, fossil fuels and so on. See you tomorrow.